Hi, you're listening to the Christian in the Campus podcast, and I am lucky enough to be here with my two illustrious interviewees, one who is laughing at me currently, Cole Van Horn, and the other is Barry Bachman. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves rather than me telling you about their lives. So, Cole, you're uh, your first age before uh, beauty. So, <laughs> Can it be both? Yeah, actually, you win. Barry's the worst, so. Well, all right, I'm Cole Van Horn. I have been the international campus minister at Wolf Life Campus Ministry in Jonesboro, Arkansas for uh, multiple years. <laughs> I, I don't do math well. Uh, yeah. And right now I'm just the interim director, uh, kind of doing it all. Cool. Yeah, I'm Barry uh, Bachman. I've been at the UC at OK State. I attended undergrad here and worked as the international intern um, for a couple years and then now I'm, I'm the campus ministry apprentice. Um, and I had the, the great honor of being Barry's boss uh, for a year of my life and, um, and got to fire him multiple times. So I'm really glad to get to probably do that on air uh, during this interview uh, when I disagree with what he says. Um, <laughs> well, um, we are talking about um, as a uh, as kind of your intros uh, seem to, to, to hint to uh, the idea of other cultures, right? And what is the posture, what is the Christian posture uh, towards other cultures, especially as we live out our lives on college campuses? So um, kind of the, the, the question I want us to, to maybe engage with as we begin this conversation is um, just as y'all have dealt with college students for Cole, a lot of years, Barry, uh, being a college student and, and, and now dealing with college students um, as more of a mentor, in your experience, what is the default posture of a Christian college student to the diversity of campus? Uh, I, you know, what I've seen is um, a lot of just, you know, um, what is the word? Uh, where, where they're not paying attention. Yeah. It, oh, um, like in different. Oblivious. Indifference. Right? Indifference. Yeah, I was thinking about this before, and then when we started rolling, my, my mind went away. But um, yeah, no, just indifference, generally, uh, especially if they come from a smaller town like I did. Um, just not paying attention to them. Uh, not paying attention, attention to the diversity. Just kind of stuck in their own headspace and not, not at all aware. Yeah. Very Yeah. Very. I yeah, I think largely just, yeah, unaware is a great word. You're, you're probably not eating at the same places. You're probably not hanging out at the same places. You probably may not even be living at the same places. Um, so there's just a lot of factors that, that make you pretty unaware of, of the diversity around you probably. Yeah, and Barry, you're already kind of starting to engage with this, but like, yeah, like how did this become the default posture, right? So like the default posture of a, of a Christian college student to the, to the diversity of campus is, indifference well like how did it come how did it come to be that way and like why like why what are kind of some of the underlying factors um and systemic problems that have led to that like one thing is you know say you're only going to be here for a semester maybe two years um it's probably not worth buying a car um it's not worth going through the hassle of getting a driver's license so that's going to affect where you live probably going to pay more which may not appeal to american students so yeah that's going to you're just not going to be in the same places. You, you probably aren't playing the same sports, maybe. Um, there's just a lot of things that, that affect that. Well, even here on our campus, um, they pretty much put all of the international students that live on campus into one dorm. And, you know, that doesn't leave a lot of room for other, other students to interact with them on a, on a daily basis, like in their being roommates and stuff. Uh, but, I, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think there's just a, a lot of segregation on campus still. Um, it, it's just a reality. Uh, and, and even, you know, like the Chinese students hang out with the Chinese students, Indian students hang out with the Indian students, and American students hang out with the American students. Yeah, so we, we, we tend to gravitate towards those who both look and think like us, right? I mean, it's just, it's a natural thing um, that, that humanity does. And so, like, um, that, which has kind of bred this like posture of, of, of indifference, right? We just don't, it's out of sight, out of mind in some ways, right? We don't yeah, there's, like, co there's coexistence, but not a lot of cross-cultural interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good distinction, right? Yeah, like we coexist fine on some level, but there's not, 
we're, we're missing, we're leaving something on the table, right? If we aren't willing to engage across. Right, the yeah, it's not like they're mad that they're, that we're, they're here, but uh, they just don't care. Um, well, and we're, and we're going to engage kind of the idea of like overcoming this, uh, mm -hmm. the inertia of that indifference, uh, but kind of on the other side of the coin, um, you know, there is this indifference, but like, what is the calling of the Christian towards diversity? Like, what does scripture tell us? What is, uh, what does kind of the Christian life seem to paint for us on, on how, how we should be interacting with diversity in other cultures? Uh, one text that, that comes to mind for me is, is Hebrews 13 to right? So as, um, as that letter is being closed, um, one of the exhortations is, is don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Um, and, and hospitality is, is this Greek word, phylloxenia, philo, meaning brotherly love, xenia uh, is stranger, right? So it's literally, you ought to love strangers as your brother. Um, and so I think really clearly there, like we, we have a really unique opportunity um, to show hospitality um, and, and to show brotherly love to people who are not, probably not getting the same experience that we are on a college campus. Repeat the question, Ben. Um, like, you know, there's this indifference, right? The, the, the kind of default posture is indifference, but like, what is the actual calling of the Christian? You know, like what, what does scripture tell right. us about that? Well, I mean, what you see from scripture and what you see from, especially the New Testament is, well, in, in Isaiah 56, my house is a house of prayer for all the nations. Everyone can come to me. Um, through the New Testament, people from all over the, the known world, all different languages, you're bringing together um, Jew and Gentile, which are essentially the whole New Testament. And a lot of what Paul writes is bringing together two races and uh, in, in making one new nation out of them. And uh, so, you know, I would say if, if your campus ministry, if everybody at it looks like you, well, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> plain and simple. Uh, if everybody looks one way, then, then you're doing it wrong. And that's not just with international students, that's with, you know, American diversity as well. If everybody looks the same, you're, you're not fully embracing uh, the gift that God has given you on your campus. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like, um, I kind of follow up to that. Like, so if we, we lived into that calling as Christians, right. I mean, like love a stranger, the, the beauty of diversity and worshiping God, right. Like, uh, a God as big as the Christian God. Like one of the things for me is like a God as big as the Christian God. Uh, I don't want to say demands like, cause God doesn't need anything from us, but like, you know, deserves maybe a God as big as the Christian God, the, the God we believe in, um, deserves like multifaceted praise right <laughs> like you know people from every tribe language nation and tongue like praising him in, in, in all their different ways right like the christian god is so big that yeah like that that's like innate to him or like it's it's just intrinsic to how how he should be worshipped is is in so many different ways from so many different cultures and um so if we like lived to that beautiful calling of diversity and we lived into this like love of stranger um how would it better our lives on like a practical level? How would it better our lives on a spiritual level? And how would it better um, our understanding even of scripture itself? Well, I think one reason that you see all of that segregation here on campus is because you're afraid of what you don't know. Uh, you're afraid of what you don't understand. Well, if you spent time and rubbed elbows with people and really, you know, engaged with, uh, you know, we're in the apartments of someone from Nepal or they, you had them in your house, um, you start to fear them less because you understand them more. I, I have a story. I, I knew a guy that was, um, he was always, you know, Muslims this, Muslims that, uh, really generalizing about how bad uh, Muslims are. And so I thought it would be funny to take a couple of Muslim people to his house for Thanksgiving. So we did that. And by day three or four, these, these two girls, uh, Muslim girls from Bangladesh are calling him dad. They're, you know, the, 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 the dynamic has changed in, in, uh, incredibly. 
And I never heard him speak that before or, or after that. I never heard him say Muslims this. It may have been, you know, one particular ISIS or whatever, but he never generalized about Muslims again, as long as I knew the guy. Um, and so I think just, you know, interactions like that where, um, you know, you start to, to um, cross over into another uh, way of living. You're, you're, you're less afraid of the world for one thing. And that's a huge, huge deal right now. But, uh, but also, you know, you, your culture, your, your culture itself gets enriched. And I've, I've learned that um, <laughs> Americans don't have the right way to do everything. Um, my Chinese students have taught me a lot about, you know, my international students have taught me a lot about the way that uh, they do things. And I'm like, well, that's, that makes a lot more sense than the way we do it here. <laughs> Yeah, I have a I have a friend that I got to live with for a little bit from from Malaysia, and just the way that that they practiced sharing was so much less selfish. Like when we would go to the grocery store, he'd be like, "Well, I get this, you get that, and we'll share." And like, man, that's a that's just a more gracious um, disposition that I think we live with a lot in America. And so I think that it really does take away a lot of the blinders um, from making Christ Christianity American, right? Like. Um, I think that we can we can force our American culture or whatever onto our Christian faith, um, and I, I really do think that causes us to get outside of that and see through a lot of the the lenses that we have projected onto Christianity. Even yeah, simple maybe. things like uh, like family style eating uh, in in China. <clears throat> maybe not now because of the pandemic and everything, but like. <laughs> You know, you order three or four dishes for the table. Everybody gets a bowl of rice, and then you just share everything. That's yeah. fun, and and you get to try everything and experience it together, rather than just having your your one meal. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, either of y'all have uh, kind of like more stories about like just how how your lives have been enriched because of just getting to interact with other cultures? Because just I mean, knowing you, I mean, part of the reason y'all are on this is because y'all y'all done this right. Y'all y'all cross barriers, y'all cross borders. Um, on, on college campuses and, and got to know people uh, from different backgrounds. So I guess you all have some other experiences of, of, of that that y'all want to share. Yeah. So um, I went over to the local mosque here um, a, a few months back. I just wanted to get an English copy of the Quran. Um, I'd read it before, but I wanted to get a, you know, a couple of um, good translations. And I was just asking the guy for the imam that for one and within a couple hours I was sitting in his living room eating food that he had cooked with him and another guy from Chicago and I just wanted a, a book and the next thing I know I'm, I'm being invited into their into their space uh, invited to watch their prayers invited to be a part of what, what's going on in their lives um, and now you know, me and the local mom talk sometimes. We, we hang out. Um, another one I had uh, when back a few years ago, um, I had a, a couple friends and they would come over and um, spend some time with, with me and my then wife. And um, they would come over for dinner. We play games and drink Arabic tea and all that kind of stuff. They were from Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, and it, it was interesting. You have the white, the white American couple and the, the, the Arabic couple full, you know, job, workout, the whole thing. And, um, and he's, he was an, a Saudi cop. So learned a lot from him, but, um, but yeah, just, just having friends and, and sharing each other's culture, cooking for each other, all that kind of stuff, man. Yeah, one, uh, one of my closest friends, I guess, that that, I'm, that was an international student, um, I mean, you, you really do make great friends. Um, he, uh, I just got married, and, and had the circumstances been a little bit different with COVID, like, he, he probably would have been one of my groomsmen. Um, so, like, the connections that you make are, are real, you know, they're not, um, they're not, like, second-rate friendships, you know, um, that they will be some of the best friendships you'll ever make. Mm. I, one more. And I know I'm talking too much, but whatever. <laughs> um, 
uh, there was a few years ago, I called my mom because I learned, I learned uh, how to deal with her. And basically you just tell her what you're going to do. And so I called her and said, Hey mom, I invited four Korean guys down to uh, y'all's house for the weekend. Um, and she's like, no, no, no. I was like, well, it's already done. <laughs> um, she said, well, what are we going to feed them? And I said, the same thing you feed us. Well, <laughs> what are we going to do with them? I mean, I said, you know, if I came in, we'd go to the lake. You know, we'll take them out of the lake. You know, we'll just, they'll just go through the weekend with us. And she was so afraid, so afraid, so afraid. Um, so we took them down there and they had a blast. They ate everything in sight. They, uh, we took them out tubing and skiing and all that kind of stuff. Well, at the end of it, when we were leaving, my mom's crying. I said, what's going on? She goes, well, you said they have to go back at the end of the, at the end of this May, right? I said, yeah. She goes, well, I'll never get to see them again. So her whole attitude was changed by that one interaction such that, uh, a couple of years ago, I called, I called her and said, Hey, um, there's a couple of Jap my Japanese girls coming down to hot springs to go to the, the bath houses. And I said that she could stay with, with you guys. And she goes, Oh yeah. Okay. Whatever. I wasn't even invi in, involved in it. She just, you know, said, let, you know, tell them where we live, give them the address and let me know when, when they're coming in. So, uh, but, but things change so much just from, from a few interactions. Hmm. Yeah. The, um, well, yeah, th thanks for sharing those, those, uh, those stories. And just like, if you're listening to this, right, like hopefully like you just like, if you have anxiety, which I think is common, right? Like, I think one of the reasons like the default posture is just indifference and just lack of engagement is like, like, it's like social anxiety is a thing anyways. And when you're adding crossing, like, cultures on top of that like it's even more right and so hopefully it's just as you're listening you know you're just kind of feeling that social anxiety maybe when you think about this drop for you um and and, and this kind of leads to, to to kind of the another question i want to ask you on that is um why is there so much dissonance right so we between our calling as christians right so like we are called to love a stranger we are called to a diverse worship of our of our big god um and then our action and posture of indifference and lack of engagement uh, when it comes to diversity, right? So like, like why, why is there this dissonance that's there? You know, I've hit on some of these things, but I guess just keep, keep unpacking that. Combination, I don't care and I'm afraid. Uh, I'm afraid to I'm afraid to reach out because what if they think I'm crazy? I'm afraid to reach out because what if I offend them? I'm afraid of all sorts of things. Um, and the other one is, well, someone else will do it. I don't mm. care. That's not my, that's not my, that's not my calling. Mm. Yeah. That's the international minister's job or the international intern's job. Sure. Yeah. I had a dime every time I heard that. <laughs> Or at least, you know, at least saw that, you know, be the underlying. Yeah, I think that, like, I remember um, sitting in a class called Issues and Diversity, which is like the easiest A you can get at OSU. But I applaud OSU for that because they guarantee that every, or a lot of people at least get to listen to three credit hours of not racism, you know, um, something that really hopefully gets them out of their bubble. But I remember sitting in that class, um, and ironically, it's where I, I met my best friend, um, you know, from, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I remember sitting in that class and, and they, they were talking about the power of a single story. Um, and that whenever you only have one category um, to define someone or some race or some religion by, that really um, kind of is the encapsulating narrative. Um, and so the only, maybe the only story that you've ever heard um, of, a, of a Muslim is some awful terrorist attack who, if, if you ask my friend from Saudi Arabia, he would not even even give them the right to call themselves Muslims. He'd say that's not even that's not even a Muslim. That's not even they don't they don't represent what I stand for. Mm -hmm. um, and so letting yourself really just engage someone as a as a person as someone made in the image of God really can um, can help overcome that a lot. But I, but I think that just allowing those stories to stand is is what so much of um, what stands in the way really. Mm -hmm. Well, it, and it humanizes people. It humanizes yeah. people groups. So, I mean, again, it's easy to say Muslims this, Muslims that, but when you know and can put a face to it, 
Mm. Well, it's, it, it changes the entire dynamic. Yeah, I think a, a lot, you're right with, with Islam that people, I mean, maybe all they know is 9-11. Um, yeah. Or, you know, they, all they've heard about Chinese folks are, is communist government. Um, you, know, you know, there's always a reason to fear groups of people. But then when you humanize them with stories, with interactions, you know, I got, I got so many friends all over the world in people yeah. in areas where people should should be afraid mm. um yeah yeah and like one thing too like um or just a couple things like um especially those who you're going to interact with on a college campus like guys like you can trust that the american government vetted them <laughs> you know like <laughs> the amount of fear that you should have engaging internationals on a college campus is just just super low right um and like one thing i i have something else i kind of want to bring up but but just while we're on this topic, like uh, I, I know in some previous conversations we've had, like something y'all pointed out to me that's really interesting is like they're a whole lot more scared of us than we are of them, right? So it's like if we're willing to like break that ice, like they're like going to want to engage, right? Like it's it's like a it's an awesome way to build community, right? Yeah, uh, and I think it's to that point, Ben. I think it's worth considering that um, that it's just as easy for them to perceive you through a single narrative, right? They've probably mm -hmm. had a friend who has come back and told them about a not so positive experience studying mm -hmm. in America, right? So if, if they perceived you through that same single narrative, um, you we wouldn't really appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a statistic and, uh, and it's 80% of, of international students will never step foot in an American home. Um, and that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, if you think about a country that um so many people claim to be christian in that 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 is that really is an utter lack of hospitality oh boy um and <clears throat> sorry uh so when i was in china teaching one of the assignments i gave my students was to write down um the top if they were going to go live in america and be an international student what are the top five things you would fear um Number one was loneliness. I mean, mm. it makes sense. And that's, that's true of everybody. Two was the food. They're afraid of our food. <laughs> they, they're afraid of losing their food. But number three, and, and I think this told me a lot about how our media and our, our um, what comes out of America, our soft, what is it, soft, um, soft diplomacy, what it, what it really does to our image abroad. Number three is they think they're going to get shot. Mm. They're so afraid. They're so afraid of what they see uh, from our gun culture that, I mean, they're, they're thinking that around every corner is someone with a gun ready to, ready to pull them away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's something that, that we have to combat here, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, um, like because, I mean, here, here was the, the place I wanted to go uh, is, like, you know, the question was, like, why is there this dissonance between our calling as Christians and the reality that we live out? Well, like how much of it is that we don't take scripture seriously, right? Like we believe, you know, like as Christians uh, in the great commission, right. And, and one of the ways that it's described that um, like international students flooding from places that like, it's really hard to get Christians to right, and missionaries to like, they're flooding into our campuses and we do nothing about it. Well, how much of it is like, well, maybe we just don't take God at his word. <laughs> you know, like, like he says, you know, go into all nations. Well, you know what? You're not going to do that. I'll send them to you. And we do nothing about that. Like, um, you know, are, are we taking scriptures hey, seriously if we're not doing this? Well, no, we're not. And that, <laughs> I mean, this is one of the soapboxes I can get on, but we're not <laughs> taking scripture seriously. We're not taking the call of God seriously. We're not taking the global kingdom seriously if we do nothing about this. And mm -hmm. shame on us. And I think we'll have to answer for that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, he, he simply, he's essentially saying, Okay, I told you guys to go into the world. And for a while, you, you did it all right. But now, you guys are kind of, eh, things are changing. So I'm going to put them right in front of you, right under your nose. I'm going to put people from all over the world in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do with it? Yeah, and we have that opportunity, right? People are being sent here, right? They, 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 they come here with certain narratives in their head about who we are, who Christianity, what Christianity mm -hmm. might be. 
And unless we're willing to have that personal interaction with them, unless we're willing to invite them into our home, we don't get the chance to change that narrative for them, right? Um, and, and get to humanize Christianity and get to incarnate Christianity for them, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I love that word there, Ben, <clears throat> incarnate, because I think that really is a compelling like narrative. Whenever we start to like think about what does it look like to engage international students is like the incarnation, um, you know, like, and, and at the end of John's gospel, Jesus will make the statement that as the father has, so I'm sending you, right? That, that just as he came and, and crossed all kinds of barriers to come and live among us, eat like us, um, everything that, that he came, um, and I think of, of like, whenever Lazarus died, he, he literally just goes, and the first thing he does is he cries with Lazarus' sisters. He, he mourns with those who mourns. He just lives life with people. Um, and I think that, that that's, I think that's awesome, especially whenever we think about what it means to, to do life with international students. Just go and just be where they are and then, and just keep being there and just keep doing life there and you'll build relationships. That'll happen. Yeah. The, um, well, uh, I feel like, you know, we, we've kind of like created this dissonance and, and talked about, you know, why, why, why it's there. And so kind of like moving forward in the conversation, um, how do we overcome it, right? Like how do, you know, the great commission reverse is happening. The world is at our doorstep. We're not doing much about it right now. So like, how do we overcome that, right? And specifically, how do we overcome the inertia of our tendency to only interact with people who look and think like us, right? Because that's a really easy question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, but it, <laughs> it, it's not very nice. Because what I do is I just push people into it. And, and I know I know you're not supposed to push people or whatever, but get them out of their comfort zone in some way uh, so that they, they're forced to reckon with this. Uh, they're forced into an encounter with people. So we do, we do something called conversation partners. And, uh, and we, we have a, the workbook form of Luke. And every year... I have, I'm flooded, except for this year because COVID, I'm flooded with new international students saying, I want to do this. I want to work on my English. I want, you know, some want to know more about it. I most just want an American friend. Um, and so I'm flooded with people and I, I present it to my American students and they're just like, mm, yeah, I, I, well, I don't know enough or, well, I don't know if I have time or, well, I, I just, I didn't, uh, let me wait till next semester. I'm like, no, you're going to do this. <laughs> here's, here's the number you need to call, set up a meeting, right? Start meeting with them. And then a lot of times at the end of the semester, they come back to me and they're like, thank you for pushing me into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was what I needed, but I was afraid to do it. <clears throat> so my, my short answer is, push people to do the things that you know are good, that you know are right. Uh, push yourself if you, if you don't have anybody motivating you to do it. But, but, but man, I know it's not comfortable. But since when is being a disciple maker comfortable? Mm -hmm. Because even if you're working with people who are Christians, you got to call them out for stuff. None of it's easy. None of it's fun. I mean, you know what I'm saying, but, um, <laughs> but push people into stuff that they're not ready, that they don't think they're ready for because you know, they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and on the flip side, like find someone to hold you accountable to it, right? Like if you're sitting here listening to this as a student, go to your, go to your campus minister and say, Hey, this is something I want to do. Make me do it. Right. Like, and, and I think that, you know, set a time and a place and do it, go to, um, you've probably never been there, but there's probably a restaurant in your town that serves food that's not American. Um, and so get, just go and eat there and just have conversation. Um, go to, there's probably parts of, of the gym that the international students hang out because they probably don't want to hang out in the parts where the American students are because they feel not wanted there. And so go to those places, um, set aside a time and a place, because if you're not intentional, it's, it's not going to happen. That's, that's kind of how we found ourselves where we are in this conversation. But and if you need somebody to hold you accountable, call me. <laughs> I'll yell at you for a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, 
like what um you know like let's say there's a student who's listening to this and let's say let's say they're part of the RFC and I'll admit I, this is something like as a minister on a sy- systemic level I've I've not been great at I've been here a year and a half and I've not made it as strong as pushes as, as I personally want to have made in terms of pushing us out um, of our comfort zone and pushing myself out of my comfort zone when it comes to this so like um you know let's say it's a student at the RFC and they hear this and they're like yeah you know what like I do I want to get involved I want to engage what is maybe the first one or two steps they should make if they want to start engaging with um, international students or, or just people across cultural barriers on the college campus? And it's harder right now during COVID, but like, let's say, you know, when, whenever things clear up a little bit more and you're free to interact, what are the first two steps they should make? Go, one. Make, go, ahead. go for it, Cole. Well, I was just going to say, go make one friend. Yeah. Because through making one international friend, you're going to meet a bunch more. Mm-hmm. So go sit down and meet one international student. Yeah. And, and cross it, you know, it might be, you may feel like it's awkward, um, but largely they want American friends and they have a hard time making them so they sit alone. Just push yourself to go do it. And I'm pretty sure it'll turn out well. Yeah. So like, would you even say like, you see someone sitting alone in the union, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, go, just go sit with them, right? I mean, that, that's what you mean by go make a friend, right? Yeah, just go up and say, hi, I'm Cole. Nice to meet you. Uh, where are you from? Um, and then, you know, if you make that friend, start learning more about their, about their country of origin and their culture and that sort of thing. Do a quick Google, sh- Google search. Um, watch some travel channel, you know, I mean, that's, that's how I learned a lot about, um, my, about culture is from Anthony Bourdain, (laughs) I'm being real honest. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, man, just go do it. Yeah. And just develop a friendship. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's what you would do with everyone else. Um, and, and probably even in your American friendships and the friendships that you make on campus, you're probably a little bit uncomfortable, um, like letting your life be a conduit for the gospel there. Um, but I would, I would say it's easier to talk to an international student about faith than an American student. They're probably more interested in it than Mm -hmm. the average American student that you meet. Mm. Why, why would you, why would, why do you think that is? (laughs) That's just, that's just, that's just, that's just. Uh, so I, I, I agree with you, Barry. Um, and the why I think is because it's stuff they've never heard before or stuff they've heard different versions of, and they're just wanting to, to understand. I think, you know, uh, with a lot of East Asians who have no faith background at all, it's like, well, why would you believe in something other than yourself? Uh, with a lot of, um, you know, like Hindu students, it's this Jesus that uh, treated everybody equally. Well, that doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, I mean there's a lot of cultural reasons, but um, largely they haven't been they haven't been beat over the head by Bibles for a long time, <laughs> and um, it's not their culture, so they're interested to listen, just like you would be interested to listen culturally about their religion or whatever. So, mm, yeah, it's interesting. The um. And this is kind of a, a good way to maybe round out this discussion. Um, like, you know, if it's more comfortable, right, to interact with those who are like us, right, just to go with the flow of that inertia is already pulling us in. Um, why is it worth it, right, to interact with those from a culture that's not like our own? Like, right, and, and, to, and maybe even like on a personal level, right, like, you'll kind of hint at this, but like, in what ways have you feel like you've grown personally because you've engaged with people who are not like you? Like, how, how has it pushed you to grow on a personal level? Well, on a personal level, <clears throat> I came from a town of about a thousand people, all white down in South Arkansas. And that casual racism flows, you know, uh, all over the place. Um, and I got to college and started looking at diversity and, you know, just kind of curious about it. And then through when I became a person of faith and, and through the campus ministry, got involved with uh, different cultures. Well, now look at where I'm at. 
you know, I, I went through this process I'm talking about of being exposed and learning to, to not fear, then to appreciate, then to embrace other cultures, then to go live in other cultures, then all that. So I know that, I know that that has very deeply impacted the fiber of who I am and the way I see the world. Um, it, it's changed the way that I see people, the way I see contemporary issues. It's changed everything mm -hmm. because I have been exposed to something entirely different than my small little town knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's the, the case for everyone. And I, th I honestly believe that we should all go live in another country for a year or two uh, at some point in our lives because your, your entire worldview will change uh, for the better typically. And how, and how did that pull you, maybe just directly, how did that pull you closer to God? Like how, how has that like shaped you spiritually and like brought you closer to know, knowing, understanding God and knowing who he is? I see him all over the world. I see him in, in, in every different culture I've been a part of. I see just, you know, glimpses of him. I see clearer pictures of him through the way that, uh, that Chinese folks take care of their, their grandparents right i see i see glimpses of him in everything uh, you know in the in the the joy of an african church and the joy of you know so so you you your eyes are opened yeah to the beauty of the diversity of his creation mm -hmm. yeah i would say going back to kind of you opened ben with this idea of um a big god deserves multifaceted worship um, and, and kind of in the same way that like in Genesis one, we see male and female made in the image of God and they like together are able to more fully image God to creation. I think that the same is true with the diverse people, right? That, that I think it, it changes your view of culture that instead of culture being this intrinsically bad thing, culture is good. It's been, it's been infiltrated by sin, but it's still good. Um, in, in every culture, I, I think, um, images God, it, it was meant to, to reflect God. And so I think that you really, in seeing more cultures, you really get to see a more full picture of the image of God in his creation, in his image bearers. And I think that it helps you appreciate that more. Um, it helps you appreciate people as image bearers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to, I want to pick up on something you said, um, where you're talking about, Oh, what was it? But anyway, um, on Friday nights, we have uh, a dinner here at Wolf Life. Uh, and, and we just sit a bunch of different people around a table. And, and, oh, it was culture is something to be shared and something to be excited about rather than something, uh, a negative. Um, I see people trading words, trading recipes, trading, trading cultures uh, at that uh, every week when you've got, you know, eight people from eight different countries sitting around a table together eating. Uh, there's just so much sharing that goes on and, and it's more of a curiosity than something to fear. It's, I'm curious about your culture because of this. Now let's, let's talk about this. Let's ask this. And we've had myriad good uh, conversations about religion and faith and all that with Sikhs and uh, Buddhists and Muslims sitting around a table eating. And it's all in the effort of sharing with each other, not in the effort of tearing each other down. Mm. And I think that's, that enriches your life just by itself. Yeah. And like yeah. one thing too, like in that, like um, as Christians, we should be the ones who are most willing to have that conversation because we know that in Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And if we believe that statement, right, that Jesus is, is like the word incarnate, right? The, 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 the truth of God in flesh, then like we should be the ones who are most confident to actually go expose ourselves to views that differ from us. Cause we know that we, you know, we serve the one who embodies truth. Um, and, and so we, we shouldn't be fearful of having those conversations. We, we should be excited about it and, and, um, and, and more willing to have a posture of listening because of it um, rather than a posture of, I need to defend because, well, no, God doesn't need defense. And probably one of my favorite quotes comes from Marilyn Robinson. And she said, you know, nothing true can be said of God out of a posture of defense. 
Um, and it's, yeah, like God doesn't need our defending. He's bigger than that. And, uh, and, and so we get to, um, we get to listen, right? We're freed to listen uh, and, and, and engage in, with others, uh, the posture of, of wanting to know about um, their lives. And um, yeah, there's, there's so much more I, I know that y'all could share and, and that uh, we, we probably want to, but for time's sake, uh, I'm going to ask um, one of you to pray us out and uh, I'm just going to let y'all fight over who that's going to be. So. And Barry Cole, John. It's Barry, Barry, <laughs> Barry John. So, Cole, you pray us out and, and we'll, we'll be done. Yeah. Father, I am thankful for this conversation with two friends, one old and one new, and, and um, getting to talk about the, the diversity of your world and the diversity of your creation and uh, the, the goodness that, that comes from interacting with it. And God, I just pray that we are people that see uh, your beauty in other people and other cultures and, and are not afraid to cross those barriers to, to reach people for you. Father, let us be people of relationship, people that, uh, that, that people that are not like us can look at and say, you know, I still, I, I'm different, but I, I still want to be that person's friend. It's through Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.